Hi there, and welcome to Season 3 of the If You Ask Betty podcast, a podcast about all kinds of development topics for all kinds of learning professionals. I'm Betty Danowitz, and this is the Accessibility Series episode, Accessibility in Real Life. Today I have with me one, two, three, four, five folks who are passionate about accessibility. I have Jessica. Ooh, Jessica, I should have asked you how to say your name first. Tell me Curiazis. how to say your last name. Curiazis. I would totally have butchered that. Jessica Curiazis, Diane Elkins, Judy Katz, Susie Miller, and Meryl Evans. Welcome, friends, and thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, let's go around just real quick. Tell us what you do and why you wanted to be a part of this accessibility series. We'll start with Meryl. I am a professional speaker and accessibility marketing consultant who educates people on the value of accessibility and involving people with disabilities. I wanted to be a part of this series to help spread the message on the value of accessibility to the audience. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you. How about you, Diane? I'm Diane Elkins. I'm with Artisan eLearning and eLearning Uncovered. And uh, I want to be a part of this conversation because very often accessibility topics have been relegated to the back room, the smallest session in the conference. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be mainstream. I want it to be the thing you talk about as much as you talk about anything else in our industry. And hopefully these, uh, the series on accessibility will help sort of push that goal forward. Um, how about you, Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica Kiriazis. I have been in the training and performance development field for about 25 years, and I currently design and write training for um, both web-based and instructor-led for government agencies. Um, I wanted to participate today because I have a sight impairment, and so I know just how much it impacts both your personal and professional life when uh, things are not accessible. And I think that when people don't make their products accessible, it is because they don't understand the consequences for the end user and or they don't know how easy it is and how um, or how to do the process for, for making things accessible. I'm hoping today to share some of that end user experience um, so that people will understand just how important it is and walk away from the podcast feeling compelled to make their products accessible. Wonderful. All right, Susie, you're up. Okay, so um, I'm basically I'm here because I'm I'm extremely passionate about uh, making learning accessible. So um, I am the founder and director of a an agency that specialises in e-learning accessibility, and I'm also um, the author of a book called Designing Accessible Learning Content. So basically. Um, I suppose my, you know, the ultimate aim for me of, uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve uh, with our kind of accessibility journey is making um, accessibility, uh, making all learning accessible as the default. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And last but certainly not least, the shining star, Judy Katz. Hi, um, I'm Judy. I am an instructional designer and product manager, um, and I uh, focus on accessibility quite a bit in both of those roles. Um, and I also do some work helping organizations and individuals do better um, designing accessible learning experiences um, and policies and such um, for a neurodivergent audience. Um, that's a very personal thing for me. That's why I wanted to be part of this. Um, I am thrilled that we're starting to talk more about invisible disabilities mm -hmm. um, and about, you know, not at all to, to play the oppression Olympics here, but um, there are, uh, there, there is, there is so little attention given to accessibility at all. Um, and really neurodivergence is one of the things we're just starting to pay attention to. So mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to be able to, to be a part of that um, and to speak to that from a personal uh, perspective. Well, thank you guys so much for those quick introductions. Um, I just wanted to kind of set the stage for who's here, what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about accessibility. So this is this is the third episode in the I Have Questions About Accessibility series. And the previous two episodes were titled Accessibility But Why Though? and Accessibility in L&D. And so today I want us to really dive deeper into sort of the vulnerability of the topic. And I want to talk about the why. You know, so, we, so in previous episodes, we've defined accessibility, who the audience is. Um, but let's sort of refresh that just in case somebody jumped right to this one. Who, who would you say is the audience of accessibility? Who, who's our main audience? I mean, to me, it's everyone. 
we've I think we've we've done a good job over the the last couple of episodes of making the point that you know of course accessibility is is important for people who have impairments and mm -hmm. um, making things that are accessible can often be a a, a hugely important and impactful thing for um, people whose life circumstances are simply different. Um, and I think that uh, often when we when we make things that are accessible, we also make them more usable for for everyone. So to me, it's everyone. And as, as somebody has also made the point, which uh, I, I it was not even very friend of mind. Um, if you don't have a disability or if you don't have a need for accessibility now, you still could tomorrow or a year mm -hmm. from now. Um, and so it's it's, it's important for everyone, I think for potentially a lot of different reasons. I, I agree whole, wholeheartedly. We'll, we'll get someone else's thoughts, but just right now while I'm thinking of this, we talked earlier about how, you know, you, you go someplace and there's a ramp and you don't think to yourself, if you don't need the ramp, I have to find another way to go down. We, we just use the ramp, right? And so even though we don't necessarily need it, so it's like, it, it's accessibility, you're absolutely right, is for everyone. I know for me, um, I have worn glasses you know, since I was 10 years old and very soon I'm going to need to get the dreaded bifocals because I've now getting to the part where I look at my watch and it's too close. I can't see it. Like, I'm like, Oh, that's not cool at all. You know, I <laughs> like, and, and, and by not cool, I mean, I'm not ready for that change personally. Right. So I don't, I'm not excited about having by Fogles, because I feel like I'm too young for that. Somebody say you're too young for that. You're, you're too, too young, young for that. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. I needed that validation. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? So like, and that's a very small thing. And it, and, but at the same time, that's when I will need something that is more accessible. Just like you said, Judy, I might not need it right now. Well, I, I probably actually do. But when I actually come to terms with that and accept that I need that, then I will be able to benefit from that. Okay, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm Go actually ahead, a walking example of that right now. Okay. So um, I don't have normally in my life something that would be classified as a disability, except for the last six months. So I have something called frozen shoulder or mm -hmm. adhesive capsulitis. Mm -hmm. And it basically all the squishy stuff in your shoulder that lets your shoulder move just rocks, rock hard. Mm. And so after several cortisone shots, months and months of physical therapy, couple of extra procedures. I'm going to demonstrate for those of you who can see, here's how far, far I can lift my arm. And if you can't see, that's about a 45 degree angle down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are days, you know, when it comes to e-learning, there are days where I can't use my mouse all day. Mm. And I have to use my non-dominant hand for my mouse. And I'm not as precise. And I was working with some software one day and their buttons were so small and I felt like I was on track to click that button. And then at the last minute, my hand shook mm -hmm. and I clicked the wrong button. And then I had to recover from that all with my left hand. So um, uh, the quote I heard from somebody at Procter & Gamble and their accessibility team is, all ability is temporary. Mm -hmm. Every last bit of it. All ability is temporary. So everyone is your audience. Everyone. Very good. All right. So let me ask you, I, I'd love to hear from all of you on this. How, how can you relate to this audience? Obviously, when we say everyone is your audience, we are everyone. But when it comes to folks who have disabilities or invisible disabilities or usability issues or need some extra help, like I, you know, I can just keep going with the thesaurus. How can you relate to that? I would love for you to tell us about your experience as someone who is sort of part of that primary audience. Um, and how about, Meryl, can we start with you? I've been using caption since 1983. I was born profoundly deaf. And when the pandemic hit, it was really a platform to add automatic caption. I mean, all these years before the pandemic, there were no captions or video calls. I never joined video calls. Mm. And then a few months after the pandemic, the, a lot of the major platforms added automatic caption, these have changed my mm -hmm. personal life and career. On a personal level, my youngest spent his last year of high school on the second floor of our home slash office slash school building. Every uh -huh. day he walked past my office and see I was on caption video call. The last year, 
he went off to Purdue University. Throw her up, y'all. So <laughs> I worried I would never hear from the kid again. <laughs> Not until he wanted to come home. Or if he needed laundry advice. So one day, I got the most... Oh, and the first photo I got from him was of a washing machine. So I kid you not. <laughs> one day, I got the most amazing text message from him. He asked if I would like to do a caption video call. That would have never happened without mm-hmm. the pandemic. It normalized caption video calls for him. And it also changed my career as an advocate for people with disability and accessibility. That's because it left me join conversations and be included like right now. Even though I'm a lip reader, I don't do video calls well without caption. It feels like I'm flying without a net. Mm-hmm. And on average, lip readers only catch one third of what's said. Mm. Caption help fill in a lot of the blanks. And as Betty, you were saying about the ramps, we all use ramps. When yes. we're using shopping carts, two cases, pulling nuggets, well, caption are one of the best examples of how everybody uses accessibility because Absolutely. 80% of the people who use caption are not deaf or hard of hearing. And I hear every day from people telling me why and they use caption and they're not deaf. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Meryl. How about you, Jessica? Uh, So I am mostly blind and I uh, started losing my vision when I was 10. So I, um, and that was 1980, not to date myself too much, uh, or 82, Mm -hmm. sorry. Um, But point being that I had a very impaired sight by the time we were all starting to use computers all the time. And I chose my career based on what I wanted to do Um, and not how tough it was going to be to do it. Um, So I do use a screen magnifier to enlarge my screen to about 400%. I have to use high color contrast, and I use a screen reader to listen to the text. Uh, When people don't design and develop their products, whether it's web-based learning or a learning activity and instructor-led training or even a job aid to be accessible, I'm excluded from using it. So I'm just not Mm -hmm. part of the group. I don't have equal access to the same information as everyone in the group. Um, I'm spending time trying to create a workaround to get access to the information instead of listening to the trainer or the presenter or participating in the learning activity. Um, So my learning is interrupted if things aren't accessible. Um, And in my experience, anything that is an image is inaccessible. So if we're presenting information Mm. in an infographic or a table that was frozen for formatting purposes, uh, a picture that's supposed to solidify the concept, um, any of those things are inaccessible to me. And in fact, um, COVID went the other way for me a little bit because now we're having all our meetings via Zoom and Teams and that kind of thing. And when a presentation is being delivered that way, it comes across as an image. So I don't have access to it. Um, and so similarly, you know, everybody wants to have those conversations in chat. Well, if I'm listening to the text in the chat with my screen reader, then I I can't listen to two things at once. So I'm listening to the chat and not to the presenter. Um, Mm -hmm. And then same thing if, you know, they don't send the presentation ahead of time, they send it immediately before the meeting, then I have to choose um, between listening to the information that's on the slide or the the presenter. So so I just simply am am excluded and, and my learning is interrupted when things aren't accessible. So that's how I'm impacted. Thank you, Jessica. Sure. Susie? Okay, so um, I'm uh, one of a very large uh, number of people with uh, a neurodiverse condition, which really was, was only diagnosed uh, when I was an adult. And actually, in my case, I literally have had the assessment and the diagnosis a few months ago. But 
for probably you know most of my life I have thought that I did have some kind of of dyslexia something that made the way that I was uh, you know the way that I was processing content that I was processing obviously in the in the case that we're talking about learning the way that I learned just seemed to be different to but I couldn't ever really understand why why it was that I was having difficulties or or, or you know the challenges that I was having so for me it was it has been an absolute revelation as I say, to, mm. to finally have an assessment and finally to, to understand that actually, you know, I've never thought, well, I, I you know, I studied English uh, language and literature at university. I've written a book. So I was thinking, well, how can I, you know, the perceptions that you have of what of, of what dyslexia is, it, it are kind of, you know, are very sometimes, you know, you just make assumptions that everyone who mm. has dyslexia, you know, sees the text change and has have, has problems, you know, reading and et cetera. However, um, for me, as I say, finding out and how actually having an assessment and understanding that for me, it was it was slow processing that was 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 uh, an issue that I had and I could really understand why you know for so many years I had just felt that I was you know that 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 something just was was different to other people and that I was I was coming at learning in a different way and it just some some things just didn't work for me at all and I could never really understand why that was so yes and I'm, I think it, that that probably that story of of, of maybe um having an undiagnosed condition comes back to mm-hmm. the fact that making making learning you know accessible for everybody making it you know there are so many people who do have undiagnosed or, or are unknown um I, I, judy i know you were talking about neurodiversity um, earlier and how important it was so for me i suppose it is that that personal experience of of having had that for so long how how much it affected my confidence as i was uh, you know as I, through my through my journey and my through my career and then finally kind of for me it really does feel like everything's kind of fitted into place and I finally uh, understand you know you know why it is that that I learn in a particular way and some things just don't suit me at all so and I think for me as well that that is probably you know why I am so passionate about making this so that other people who are in the same position don't have that experience you know mm-hmm. who, who that you know if we make if we make learning content accessible for everybody then it caters for everyone no one is excluded you know whether they know that they they have a, a neurodiverse condition or not so uh, uh, yeah as I say for me it has probably probably can guess that it's been quite a revelation and a, and yeah. a journey for me probably feel like you've finally just exhaled yes like- Yes. Oh. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the best tweet the other day, and I'm probably going to misquote it, but it was about the importance of, for some people, diagnosis, although formal diagnosis yeah. isn't uh, available for uh, all I conditions agree. for all people, but the assessment and knowledge, information yeah. is important um, because it tells you you're not a broken horse, you're a normal zebra, Definitely. you know, something yeah. like that. And I like uh, it. That, I like that. That's, yeah. We're finding that out with a lot of, uh, a lot of neurodivergence. Um, especially for people who demographically don't fit the diagnostic criteria for neurodivergence. I'm also going to say, by the way, that I I do tend to fall um, uh, into that trap of talking about neurodivergence, but actually meaning autism and ADHD, Uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia and and lots of other conditions are actually included in neurodivergence. So I'm going to apologize in advance um, that I I sometimes do that. But thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, That's wonderful. Judy, tell us tell us how you relate. Oh, okay. Um, so also, um, I am I am both autistic and have ADHD, or I'm Audi uh, as we say. Um, and this has been. Um, I was also diagnosed very very late. Um, like a lot of um, women, I was not uh, really aware of how much I fit the criteria um, until one of my kids who fit the demographic, um, you know, uh, uh, categorization that we think of as autistic um, was diagnosed. So one of my kids is autistic, one of them is ADHD. And learning about those things helped me understand, you know, that they, 
you know, those apples didn't fall far from the tree. Um, mm -hmm. They got it from somewhere. Um, but this has been a huge thing in my professional life. Um, I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, but I also want to to point out that I, I, I think it's important as we talk about these things that we don't lean into stereotypes. If you mm -hmm. know one neurodivergent person, you know one neurodivergent mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for everybody. Um, but I particularly want to say that when we're talking about neurodivergence, because autism and ADHD have a lot of uh, stigma associated with them. Um, so this is not everybody. Um, and, you know, uh, take that take that for what you will. Um, but a, a couple of ways that um, that this has affected me in I have found, I also have a COVID changed everything for me type of story. Um, and it's about remote work and how remote work is so much more accepted and so much more common now. Um, mm -hmm. I actually became a remote worker. Actually, um, Diane, when I started working for you 12 or so years ago, um, I think that that was my first remote job. And um, all, even though I had infant twins at the time, you know, that was a revelation in me being able to control my environment. Um, and then pretty much, you know, that's been the norm for the last 10 years. Even if I've had to, you know, go, you know, find uh, a job that, or even if it limited my job search, or even if it meant me going out on my own, um, remote work now is very important to me. Um, a lot of uh, autistics get uh, overstimulated or um, otherwise the, it's problematic to be under fluorescent lights, flickering lights. Um, it can be very problematic to be interrupted a lot. Even if people aren't mm. specifically trying to, to interrupt you being in, in an open office and hearing people laugh down the hall or, or everything like that um, can really, really uh, uh, do damage to my focus, uh, my ability to concentrate, my productivity, um, all of those things. So um, working from home to me and having that be more um, common and and readily available is, is, is I think, a, a really, really great thing. I want to encourage everybody who is kind of pushing against the wave of employers trying to bring people back into the office, keep pushing because uh, working from home is or working remotely is a really good thing for for lots and lots of different people in lots of different circumstances. Um, and so so a lot of those sensory things have to do um, with autism. And then, um, of course, with ADHD, I have had a, a huge problem procrastinating my entire life. Um, I don't get that dopamine until I'm on deadline. Um, and they're, you know, just knowing that, and in this case, having a formal di uh, diagnosis and being able to get medication um, helped that tremendously. Um, and then moving toward not only medication, but changing my processes, you know, uh, finding community, talking with people about how you do this and being able to, to find the things that work for me and being able to um, put those processes into place how I want, because I'm in my work environment, all of those things have been hugely important to me. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys, for sharing that. So so I want to get a little bit deeper, if you're willing to share, what, what difficulties have you had you know, when experiences are not accessible to you. And if you have a story, like we'd like to hear that. And it, it's not that I'm asking us to talk all about, you know, all this negativity, but I think it's important for those of us who, who've never experienced what you've experienced to hear firsthand from you what that's like. And we'll just kind of go in the same order, if that's okay. Um, I think we started with Meryl. Okay, so captions are not the only thing that that people need for in terms of accessibility. A lot of people think uh, we need is a sign language interpreter if we do ASL, uh, sign language. Oh, by the way, I got what you said, Judy, about we're all different. When you met one autistic person, you met one autistic person. Same thing applies to deaf people and every other disability because I don't do sign language. But someone born deaf like me tends to end up doing sign language. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest surprises I get from people. They are shocked when they find out I don't sign. And it's just the way my life worked out. And it's worked for me. So, and on top of that, my whole family has ADHD. And they're all affected very differently. They all manage it very differently. I mean, they're not, they're not all um, stereotypical kids or stereotypes. 
Only one kid is like that. So that's a good mm-hmm. example. And about the back to capturing not being the only, only thing. I know somebody who's deaf and, okay, looking for a job is stressful. It's demeaning. It's, it, it hurts your self-confidence. We all know mm-hmm. this, right? Mm-hmm. But when you're disabled on top of it, it magnifies. It's what. And a deaf man was saying he was getting so frustrated with the application process because they were all requiring a phone number. And I mean, you enter a phone number, you can't even put down text over it. If you do have a phone for texting like I do. So, but he apparently did not even have a phone number. Which is surprising because nowadays there's lots of free phone numbers you can get. But anyway, that's besides the point. It shouldn't fall on him. It's so simple. You can make the contact field required. Just give us choices. Mm-hmm. You can ask for a text, you can ask for a phone, or you can ask for an email. And that's what one airline did. They used to ask for a phone number and that was that. But now they give me choices and it's so much better. It's amazing how one little simple change just changes your demeanor, demeanor mm-hmm. your attitude. You know, you're not having to deal with another barrier. Oh my God, they're going to call me. And I can't answer the phone. That kind of thing, it takes that away. But it's important. Everything should offer choices for communicating, both for input and for contact information and providing information. So it's very important that it's modern contact action because I once went to look up, I was looking for contact information for a company. And my choices were a phone number, which is always my least favorite. And then a fax number. How many of you have a fax these days? (laughs) And my favorite, the final one, was the snail mail. I am not going to sit down and write a letter and put it in the mailbox to be sent to these people. We want answers now. We want to contact you now. We don't want to write a week. So they need to be modern. Email, phone number, shop boxes. We have a lot of options. And... uh, we also, another thing that's important for the deaf is a lot um, notification. Mm. When I go to a hotel, when I travel alone, I get a little scared because I was in a fire when I was five years old. Mm. And I was in a carbon monoxide, in a hotel filled with carbon, carbon monoxide, and now we ended up in the hospital, my parents and I. What mm. if my parents weren't there? I would have been asleep. I would not open the door to the fireman who knocked on the door. Scary, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whenever I go traveling, you know, I look for the alarm, the light of the alarm. You would think now everybody will have them, but there are still hotels that don't have them in the room. So it may feel scary now and I don't sleep very well when I travel. Yeah. Wow, never thought about that one. Um, I do see that though. I do see the the fire alarm with the with a light, and just figured that's how they make them. So, wow, thanks, Merle, for that. Appreciate it. It's Diane, I think it was Diane that was next. Okay. Yeah. Well, I do have trouble uh, moving my arm because of a temporary, I hope temporary, uh, condition. And so it manifests itself, as I mentioned um, earlier, it manifests itself where sometimes I can't use my mouse all day. But the other thing that's an impact and that could affect anybody who does live training is I've got to move. I've got to stretch. Like right now, my back is killing me. And what I really want to do is like, oh, I need to do some stretches here. And um I think it'd be great if we can normalize on video calls that video is optional, Mm -hmm. but we also need to pay attention that that has an impact to people. So if Meryl is going to read my lips and it's video optional, she can't read my lips. So Mm -hmm. maybe I just turn my camera off for a few minutes. If you're teaching in the classroom, normalize. It's okay for somebody in the back row to get up and stretch and move. They might need it for any uh, number of reasons. If people are sitting in the back row, maybe don't call them forward. Don't make everybody come forward because I can think of 10 different reasons why that person needs to sit in the back row. Let them. So you don't know what kind of musculoskeletal issues people might have and they might need to 
get up and stretch. Someone might need to run to the bathroom really quickly. And so they want to be able to sit in the back. We just don't know what people are facing. So I think options, that's a lot of what many of you have said so far is give people choices, give people options. Yeah. And I am going to stretch a little bit because my back is. Yeah. Do it. Stretch. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to add that I am. Thank you for mentioning the lip reading. I actually just gave a presentation about online accessible online experience. And I said, make camera optional. So what we need to do is educate people to turn off your camera for a good reason. I mean, don't just turn it off because you still, you're, hair, you're having a bad hair day or um, something, or you forgot to put on your makeup. I don't know, just something superficial. But if, but there are people who get extreme anxiety yeah. being on camera, and I'm fine with that. I don't want them to be miserable on my account, please, mm -hmm. no. But just be aware, the automatic captions are not going to be perfect. And you have to keep an eye on it and let me know if you start something important so you can let me know. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of, it's, it's about being kind and being flexible. That, that's what we do. And I don't have any leg problem, but I stand up all day. I don't sit down because I would be in pain. Yeah. Oh, the other thing is when you're with a lip reader, you don't want to be rocking back and forth on camera. Right. Right. Don't rock the baby. Don't your rock camera, the camera. If you need to rock back and forth, but when you're talking, take a break. Because Yeah. That's a great nauseating. that's a great hint for it, us. It for sure. Busy. I have to say, by the way, uh just calling out good things to to do in a in a chat like this, in a video chat like this. Meryl has done this once and Diane has done this once. I think one was before we started recording, but um, I love this habit um, and I just noticed it. I'm not in the habit personally yet, but I'm, I'm trying to get there. When, right when we came on camera, I told Meryl, I love your shirt. And when she responded, she described her shirt and Diane described her, you know, when she was showing her arm, because not everybody, of course, has the same um, visibility. And I love that habit. I just wanted to call out because I've already seen it a couple of times today. Mm -hmm. And it's been to get into. Mm -hmm. And this, it's interesting you bring that up because it's something that I think we have to undo the messaging of you don't need to say that, right? So for, we were sort of brought up thinking, be succinct, people can see you. Why are you saying, like, it was sort of like you were kind of dorky if you narrated, you know what I'm saying? Like, heads are nodding just so that you guys know I'm like they're not all looking at me like I'm crazy heads are nodding because that's it is so it's like that's the opposite of what we're initially it's like inside think to do uh is you know they don't need me to explain what it is that I'm doing but but actually that's very really helpful so and sometimes it only takes a few extra words in your language mm -hmm. Because if you narrate absolutely everything you've ever do and yes. now, now I'm gesturing with my left hand, well, that's going to just be annoying to everybody. Sure. But it's something I'm very actively working on. I do a presentation on accessibility and it starts off with a picture of rental scooters, the kind, kind you see in big cities, little rental mm -hmm. scooters. Mm -hmm. Oh, the vein of my existence. That's why <laughs> yes. I'm moving. It's not safe here anymore. People just leave them in the middle of the sidewalk all the time. Yes. And I'm no longer right. safe. So, yeah. Right. So I start with a picture of that with two um, scooters in the middle of a sidewalk. And old me would have said, hey, have you seen these around town? You know, I hate it when they're scattered about like that. Well, if you can't see, you'd have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm also not going to say what everyone's looking at now is an image and it shows. <laughs> no. Right. But you can still put a few words in. So instead, I'll say, hey, have you seen these rental scooters around town? And sure. I hate it when they're blocking the sidewalk like these two are. Mm -hmm. That's giving enough context for someone who can't see, um, but it doesn't bloat the language for everybody, including the person who can't see. Agreed. So too many words, you lose your message. Yeah. But not enough, and you're losing part of your audience. Mm-hmm. It's Boy, so Diane says things. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jessica. I was just going to say, Diane says things and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My, church, <laughs> my church lady, she's coming out again, guys. She's coming out. Okay, go ahead, Jessica. We would love to hear what you have to say. Um, well, I was just going to say that, you know, it's um, so similar to 
our other ISD principles and, and techniques, really. I mean, we're always telling people use fewer words to say the same thing so people don't have to mm -hmm. sort through them to find the message. Um, and that's that's true, whether you're describing something you're doing or creating an alt tag or just plain writing uh, the content somebody's going to deliver as they're showing the bullets on the slide, so or the picture on the slide. So um, it really, it, it's... It's, and again, it's like ISD. If you explain to somebody why we do things the way we do because of how people learn, they're like, oh, yes, of course. But they wouldn't necessarily think to do it that way if you didn't point it out. Um, and I think accessibility yeah. and, and uh, closed captioning and um, some of that stuff that you were talking about, Diane, with the, uh, you don't know why people are sitting in the back of the room. And so, um, you know, you don't, you don't call people you don't call on people, just let them be an adult learner and, and manage themselves. Um, so much of that is, is just what we should be doing anyway. It just applies a little more broadly than we all thought. Yeah, I agreed. And Jessica, tell us, what difficulties have you had when, when experiences are not accessible to you? Wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's been it's been a rough road, um, especially working uh, in in the government. And so our computers are so very, very, very secure. And so our learning management system is on a different server. Our um, work instructions to tell people how to do their job. And so that's the research I have to do to uh, to then build the training on uh, inaccessible. Um, the a lot of the applications that we use are inaccessible. And so um, for me, it has sometimes meant the difference between am I so depressed I can barely function in life right now and am I going to have to give up this career I've been doing for 25 mm -hmm. years and went to grad school for uh, to do something else because the technology simply doesn't support uh, me being able to, to do what I love and, and earn a living. I'm a, I'm a single gal. I've got a one income. And um, so, you know, there's nobody else to fall back on. My, my parents are either one's gone and one doesn't have the means for that. And so, so this is it, baby. Um, the, when you asked about a story, um, the one that I thought of was so stereotypical learning and development. I thought it was perfect. As I mentioned, our learning management system is on another server. Well, what that means is I have to run my magnifier on my local machine, but I have to use either narrator or JAWS, the screen reader, has to be on the server. So I... Um, so I had to take a web-based course for security as one of our annual requirements. And in the uh, email phishing section, the um, questions themselves were accessible, but the email images for uh, determining whether it was phishing is not accessible. Um, but here's the thing, it's not in the real world either. And I've actually gotten caught a couple times because I my screen reader says Microsoft. It doesn't say Microsoft when they put an A in there instead of an O. That's the nuance there is so subtle I can't hear it. So, um, so but anyway, so I, I I was having a hard time with that. I got a few wrong. So I wanted to go use the resource document that gave the guidance about how you differentiate and you're able to tell and determine whether an email has, is phishing. Um, but the document wasn't accessible. And, and it was created by my team <laughs> that I've been working with since 2014. So they know they have a sight impaired girl on the team. Uh, they tried to make it accessible. The document was not accessible. I had to wait overnight uh, while they saved it in accessible format. Um, and then they had not set up the, um, the course to save your work. So the next day when I got the document and learned some of the information, I went back in and I had to redo all this stuff that I was using my broken vision and my screen magnifier and suffering through this eye pain um, and eye strain to, to do in order to satisfy uh, my requirement. Um, and then I don't know what happened, but like I said, you know, the screen reader has to be on the other server. And so the day before the screen reader was working and then I went in the next day and because it was on that other server and we don't have as much control, it's no longer working. So then I had to have somebody read this hour, hour and 20 minute long um, course to me with the questions and the answers and, you know, with multiple choice. And um, so it was it was quite painful. Um, and and, you know, I, again, just because because several of the items in that one experience just weren't accessible. 
Yeah. And, and I appreciate so much that you shared with us how that really made you feel. You know, you said it towards the beginning of your story, you know, that you just were like, maybe I just have to find something else to do with my life. And I think we all ha- can feel that, you know, cause it, whether it's, it's a, it's a situation like this experience that's make you, made this happen or something else. At some point we've all felt like, do I have to let go of the thing that I love and the thing that I love to do because I have to go do something else. And, uh, oh, oh, I mean, it just, I felt that deep. I felt that really deep. And so thank you for sharing that. I, I'm, I'm super appreciative that you did. Betty, if I could jump back in, one of the things that's really striking me about today's conversation, seeing so many together, is how often what's helpful for one person could be challenging mm-hmm. for somebody else. Mm-hmm. So if it's okay, I'm going to share a little something I know about Jessica and a little something I know about Judy, because sure. you're, it's exact opposites. And Judy, you have shared this publicly, so I think you're okay, is that you sometimes struggle processing audio information, especially mm-hmm. towards the end of the day. If you have to hear a lot, that's very hard. I know Jessica has superpowers in the area of audio processing. Like you listen to audiobooks on super, super fast because you process your whole world audio. So mm-hmm. what's good for somebody could be challenging for another and vice versa. And we just talked about it a minute ago where it might be better for me off camera, but it might be better for Meryl if I'm on camera. So I think to me, just seeing all of these faces around this um, conversation, it's about choices. You know, the more options we can give people for whether they're reading it, whether they're listening to it, whether um, it's text, whether it's video, whether it's audio, the more choices we can give, I think the, the broader our appeal is going to be, the broader our reach will be. Yeah, I wonder if that's that we're finally that... figuring out people don't fit in a box, you know, I mean, mm. to your point about giving giving more options is that uh, people just don't fit in that that box. And we used to do the, what, what do we decide if people were visual learners or auditory learners or, or kin- kinesthetic, I'm not saying that word right, but, um, but, but even that wasn't accurate. Like I'm glad the field grew and, and I love um, Meryl's shirt because like our whole field is like that. We don't need perfection, but we do need progress. And, and we're, I think we're headed that way um, with the whole field and, you know, I know I was hearing it when um, Judy was talking about uh, not being able to deal with the fluorescent lights and all and all so many of the things that were bothering her. I'm like, I have that same problem because of the light sensitivity and and that kind of thing. And so, you know, are they going to turn the lights off? And I used to have to be in full business professional gear wearing a baseball hat because I had to block the fluorescent lights from the Uh ceiling. So (laughs) I interrupted somebody. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. Well, I was just going to say, maybe maybe that's the future of L&D is creating options. And we have, to, we have to maybe kind of stop feeling like we're trying to do this like in such an efficient way and rather look at, okay, let's, how can we create something and, and take a page from content creators, right? And then take that content and repurpose it in another way so that if someone wants to consume it differently, uh, they can. Judy, you are chomping at the bit. What do you got? It's just yeah, machine readability is so important. Yeah. She was like, uh, ah, 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 I got to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's chop a bit ever since Jessica started talking because I was literally on the same page. I was like, we, we are talking about creating options, but for all of those here who are, are learning and design nerds, we are trying to help our industry get over the myth of learning styles mm-hmm. and having different options uh, to, to appeal to learning styles. Let's absolutely replace that with, you know, first of all, what we know from a pedagogical or andragogical perspective about uh, suiting the the learning experience to the the content and the goals of the um, and the goals of the intervention, but also about creating options to to accommodate these different needs that people have. I think that is a very very valid reason to have all of those to have mm-hmm. multiple different options. And as I brought up in one of the other episodes, this is exactly why machine readability is so important. So that you can have some good workflow, some help um, on the on the machine side to creating something that can be delivered in a variety of formats. You can have text that somebody can read that can also mm-hmm. be read through a screen reader. Um, and that text can work on a desktop and also on a mobile device. You know, there are so many so many benefits to it. And I think that's a, the, a really key part of it. The technique I, I, I use I for smell... that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I was supposed to like, hey. Um, That's okay. I, so, <laughs> um, I, I bang that drum real hard in our group because we um, we have the 508 compliant requirement, but I am literally the only person out of over 2,000 on the contract that is sight impaired. And so I bang that drum real hard and I use the, um, the technique of equivalent purpose in order to, to get those options. So instead of lessening um, the versatility of a training product to try and make the entire thing accessible, um, then that's when I come in and say, okay, you don't have to do that. You don't have to limit somebody else's learning experience. You can provide uh, this information in these two or three other ways as well. And since we have that lovely LMS, you just put them all up there with the icon um, and give a little description of, of how you're accessing the content. And then boom, you know, people have other options um, and, and they still get that the same uh, equal access to the information, but in the option that, in way that worked for them. Mm-hmm. I smell a conference session coming out of this. <laughs> like, like you, don't you like le- learning styles, content, content curation? Like, there's something there, Diane. We have to talk about that. There's got to be something there. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, you guys. This is great, uh, Susie. We'd love to hear from you. Thinking about accessibility leads to um i think just automatically because you start thinking because people who are specifically thinking about creating learning when you are thinking about accessibility it makes you think about people people's circumstances people's access needs Mm -hmm. and it is it just automatically makes you think about people empathetically and for me in the as i say in the in the um the learning that you know, if I've seen um, something that's a, a piece of learning, you know, I've done an audit on it, and then uh, we've looked at it and remediated it and, and made it an accessible piece of learning, it just automatically seems to make, it just makes that process inclusive. It makes it a better piece of learning. So providing people, thinking about giving people alternative ways to access things, thinking about using inclusive language, thinking about having um, activities, which, you know, or interactivity that, uh, you know, maybe not everybody can do in the same way but you provide alternatives for people without mm-hmm. it being this is the accessible version that people you know that people will need to access for me just makes it a better it, it's this idea of, of, of it being inclusive rather than just accessible so being an inclusive piece of learning for me is is that idea of making everyone feel welcomed and that they they belong and that you know and they were not excluding or we're using ex, in, um, inclusive language you're using inclusive imagery and as I say really important important in learning is making sure that we're providing uh, interactivity and you know and, and things that, that that really are helping people to learn so for me accessibility as I say just automatically leads to better learning more inclusive learning and you know it, it does make you uh, it's that process of kind of um, uh, unlearning and relearning everything mm-hmm. you know all of everything that we've kind of done had habits of creating things in the same way you know we were talking about um you know the, the, the different learning styles it it really challenges that and i think i, I it genuinely for me leads to to much better learning for everybody agreed judy tell us what's it uh what difficulties have, what difficulties have you had when experiences are not accessible I didn't think that was the question that we were on. Um, I think I, it is, isn't it? I, I think so. Sort of. um, so yeah, we're just I all getting like, so excited about other things people say that when, when we jump in with other stuff, and so we diverted a little bit. Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. Repeating the question, Betty, because otherwise I would have been. Yeah. Um, so I think that for me, my process of detangling, you know, what in my work life, and that includes all of the, the learning and everything that I've done, um, is sort of was impacted by my neurodivergence. Um, And so there, I think that there are ways that I don't even know this yet. Um, Mm -hmm. But if I go to, you know, if I think about all learning experiences, including school and and everything like that, I I feel like there were so many ways that, you know, deadlines and, you know, um, the the way that classes were structured were so, um, so detrimental to, how I needed to sort of 
to to work. Um, I, I feel like the whole thing has been. Uh, I, I think that that on some level, I feel like if I start untangling this, it's going to be really difficult, and I'm going to get really mad. I mean, it starts with the the um, just simply the the fact that most um, education and most training is delivered uh, through somebody talking. You know, mm-hmm. you have to show up at a place. Um, you know, you have, which includes, you know, you had to shower to be there. You have to have, you know, be groomed and what we've already d- covered how I don't even know how long it takes my hair to dry. Cause I have time blindness. Um, so you had to show up at a place, you have to be under these lights, you have to be, you know, subject to, um, all of the smells and, you know, close in person with people a lot of the time. And then you have to process everything that usually is being delivered, you know, auditorily. Um, so the, I, I feel like like a lot of this is just is is legend and it's not that i didn't get anything out of it you know if i couldn't hear at all i wouldn't have gotten anything out of it um but i i would have known about that um so it's just it's really difficult to untangle i think for me now Mm -hmm. um and i i really have not even um which is kind of weird because i because I write about this stuff, um, I haven't done a lot of reflecting on my own experience until you ask the question. So sure. that's, and, and, and that's always the, the last thing we want to do, right? Because then, because we yeah. then have to not only, we can't really be objective. We have to deal with not only what happened, but how we felt about it. And it's all tangled together. And just like you said, if I, if I start untangling, I'm just going to get really mad because, yeah. Uh, because either, and you could be mad at the, the people that were trying to teach you something. You could be mad at yourself for the way you hand, like it could be, you're just going to be mad. You're just going to be unhappy and uncomfortable. Yeah. There isn't just, it's not just anger. There's also a lot of, you know, coming to understand that there were difficulties that just weren't my fault. I didn't know. No one knew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just how it was. Um, you know, despite coming from a very privileged background, despite everybody around you know, around me doing, you know, their best, despite me doing my best, um, I just didn't get, you know, as, as complete of an experience in a lot of areas of life that as I, um, as I could have gotten. And some of that is a relief, you know, some of it is the, I'm not a broken horse, you know, kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's just a relief to know about it. And I think that I'll probably be in the process of, of detangling some of that for years. Yeah. And, and I think you hit on it when you said it, it may just be that I didn't have a complete experience. You know, it was difficult for you to really experience the whole thing in its entirety, the way it was meant to be, because there were these other things that were definitely pulling away your attention and your ability to, to really focus and process. So, um, Thank you. Thank you guys so much for sharing that and being vulnerable. Let's, let's kind of move towards the, the, the positive, the, the, what is the word I'm trying to say that, the the pleasantly surprised aspects, what, what was it like when the experience that you were in actually incorporated some principles that helped you, right? That sort of, and techniques that helped you to better, uh, to have a better experience. And, and I'm hopeful that we all have a story like this (laughs) that we can all say, oh yeah, that was really helpful. Um, Versus the others where I'm sure we could have talked for two more hours about times that it wasn't helpful. So how about you, Meryl? Can you tell us about a time when when something was incorporated that really helped you? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, um, the automatic caption dog restart, I can't tell you how many times a company has announced they've added automatic caption and then the whole community, the co- the accessibility community are saying, but we want to be able to edit our captions. We want to be able to correct them. Sure. And I'm like, yes, we do. But at least we have the option now. We have automatic captions now. No, they're not perfect, but the progress. As I'm pointing at my chart over and over yeah. again. Yes, progress so, over perfection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have to remember that. Everything we do, I mean, you can't do, you can't go from zero to 60. I mean, like the famous video platform has frustrated a lot of people for years, uh, not for years, for a year or two, because I have to ask people to turn on the caption. First of all, they have to turn it on before the meeting, those two mm-hmm. steps. 
-hmm. you have to turn around before the meeting on the work site just to confuse everybody. And then you have to be the host. And then you have to turn on the caption. Mm -hmm. And people are complaining, we want to stop acting to turn on the caption. And I get that too. I am tired of acting too. But uh, people don't, people forget how complicated programming is, sure. development, how complicated development is. And, but if the company had built the software from the beginning with capturing their mind, accessibility of your mind, we would not be in this situation. Yeah. That's what happens when you go back and have to retrofit because mm -hmm. it's like a recipe you can follow precisely, and the only way you can fix it is to make another one. So it's more yeah. expensive, it's more complicated. Yeah. Very true. Diane, what about you? I honestly don't think I have a good question, uh, answer to this. Okay. Partially That's because fair. I'm, you know, I'm dealing with a more temporary situation. Sure, sure. Very, so yeah. so maybe if somebody could invent a, a mouse that, you know, uses your left hand, but works like your right hand, but fixes your left hand so that it works. Well, I got I pretty know. good at my left hand eventually. And you've got voice command software. I mean, if this was... That's true, a, yeah. If this was a... Oops, hang on. If this was a more permanent condition... And if it impacted my right hand more often than it does, yeah, I'd be looking to get very creative and mm -hmm. I would probably be way more militant about what I'm finding out. Sure. Um, but I know there are voice command softwares, but even then as a designer, we have to design properly for it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm using voice command software, I'm using Dragon Naturally Speaking or the one that's built into Windows, I can open up a storyline course and if it's a question, I can say out loud, click submit, and it will recognize and it will click the submit button. That's great. But then there's another button that says download policy. But behind the scenes, it's called button one. Right. So I'm saying mm -hmm. click download policy, click download policy. And that affects right. screen reader users as well, because they're hearing button one going, it told me to click the download policy button. Where's the download policy button? So yeah. You know, if if this was something that was a bigger impact to my life, then yes, I would absolutely be using some of the technology because there's amazing technology out there. I could use um, uh, eye tracker software or a laser pointer to serve mm -hmm. as my mouse, or I just move my head and I can make it make different buttons work. So there's mm -hmm. so much technology that can help people, but if we don't have our courses and uh, you know, e-learning is more my my thing, so that's what I'm speaking to. If things aren't set up behind the scenes to match how they're supposed to look in the front, it's going to be hard for any technology to work. Mm -hmm. Screen readers, voice command, eye trackers, all of that. It's got to be set up behind the scenes properly to work with these technologies because it's amazing what's out there now. Yeah. Okay. I want to add on to Diane because she mentioned you mentioned that you were use voice detect voice detect technology. Well, when I had thumb surgery. I could not type for a week. I could only do one hand and that's slow, right? So I did that as to invest in speech to, speech to tech software. Yeah. But this is back in 2013, 2010, 2009. So it was long before the technology is what it is today. And all I got out of it was a, a funny blog post because I could not train that thing to work with my accent at all. Uh -huh. Even yeah. today, I work with a company, a tech company that's creating a product for people with speech disabilities, impairment, and whatnot to translate what they say. And I've trained that thing and trained that thing. People understand me most of the time, but technology does not. Uh -huh. So I don't have a fallback. Yeah. Those are great examples. How about you, Jessica? What's it like when when the experience actually takes into account what you need? Well, I don't mean to be dramatic, but it really influences my whole life. Um, because if if things 
when things are accessible, I'm now working an eight day or an eight hour day instead of a 12 hour day. Um, mm-hmm. I, and, and if you think about it, you know, just like we, when we have a win at work after the day is over, we're still celebrating. We're still having those positive feelings. It's the same when things go badly, you, you, the work day is over, but you still feel less than cause you have a disability mm-hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. And so when that's not there, I'm, I'm happier. Um, I don't have trouble sleeping. Um, I don't have to work as long because I'm not spending all that time trying to figure out how to get at the information. And I can't Mm -hmm. tell you how different my daily experience of life is. It just truly bleeds over into into everything. Um, Mm. And so not only is my work experience better, um, but my my personal after hours work experience is better too, and that's why I said earlier. You know, I don't. I just I think a lot of times people just don't when they don't make their stuff accessible, they just don't get the consequences for the end user. They don't get the breadth and depth right. of exactly. the experience. Um, you know, they think, oh, it just impacts them for these fifteen minutes, and and huh, were that true? Yeah. Yep. How about you, Susie? So I think uh, a lot of uh, the work that I do um, involves actually training people to show them how to make their learning content accessible. And I I think sort of coming back to a good experience, I suppose it's a slightly different perspective for me, but it's actually seeing, uh, you know, once people understand a bit more about how to make the content accessible, I think, you know, that a lot of people, you know, that, you know, generally, they're just not aware, as you say, Jessica, they're just not aware of the impact that it's having there. And they're they're equally not really aware, uh, Diane, you were saying about, you know, how they need to do this, how they need to make their learning content accessible. And for me, seeing people becoming aware of the the impact that they have by not making ex- things accessible and understanding a little bit more about how to do that how to, to you know to make sure that they are creating learning content that is accessible it's for me it's a kind of a light bulb moment that you see and it's the it's the the kind of you know the, the reason that I'm so passionate about is is because people actually genuinely can see that they are having a huge impact on mm-hmm. people that mm-hmm. um, it, it's for me it's that that's the reason for keeping on going with it you know we are I, I'm totally with you and totally understand everybody's frustrations and it can sometimes feel you know like a slog but it's just you know when you see that almost a transformation of yes I understand why I should do I understand the impact it has if I don't do this that um, it just you know it just it just uh, it, it makes such a, a huge difference to people and I think you know just by doing their job better in a different way yeah. they can really impact people's lives and, and and you know make them independent and, and give them a better you know um you know life experience as you're saying jessica so yeah yeah it's huge for me wonderful how about you judy okay so this one was very recent and so as we've learned i have auditory processing disorder <laughs> so i don't listen to a lot of audiobooks um unless they're fiction like i'll do fiction i really enjoy like a full cast version of american gods or you know something like that but i don't do a lot of nonfiction because if i'm learning something i really need more focus mm. um and you know there i can't trust the dopamine as much to keep me in the moment um uh, but recently i listened to an audiobook um, by Casey Davis called How to Keep House While Drowning because I already knew I liked her um, from TikTok and I liked her voice and and I was, you know, uh, in sort of an audiobook moment. So she, so I, I listened to her uh, audiobook and she has ADHD um, and she actually structured her book and the resulting audiobook to be friendly for neurodivergence. The chapters are short so that, you know, they're short and to the point um, so that there isn't a lot of, you know, wasting time and people losing focus. It's much more easier to navigate that way, especially as an audiobook, um, because it's really easy in a listening experience to sort of get lost and not know where you're, where you're going. She also did kind of a Um, If you only, you know, she sort of did a directed path through it where she would tell you, okay, the next chapter is, you know, more exposition. It's more, you know, it's not, it's not as much Mm -hmm. 
So she would, she would say, if you're doing the directed experience, go to chapter 12, you know, or whatever. So she would actually help you navigate it in a more directed way, which all of those things I think were very, very friendly to, um, to ADHD brains. And then whenever she used a metaphor, she explained it, which is very friendly to autistic brains. And I have literally never had that experience. And I thought about it a long time because I have an English degree and usually metaphors are not so much a problem for me, but there was one just that it was just a metaphor that I had never understood and never taken the time to look up. And I understood it because she actually took the time to explain it. So very friendly to autistic brains, but also, you know, not everybody, you know, uh, it might be also very friendly to English as a second language uh, or anyone who, who doesn't speak English natively. Sure. Yeah. So, um, or, you know, not everybody has had the same life experiences or the same education. So I was really touched by all of that. And of course I was like, if she can do this as an audio book, you know, how can I do this creating digital experiences as an instructional designer? How can I enable the creation of this as a product manager? Um, and so I geeked out about it for a long time, but I was so, so impressed by just this quick audiobook by a TikTok star um, about how to clean your house. It was such a wonderful, accessible experience. And, and I just want to point out that as all of you have talked about the good experiences that you've had, your entire demeanor has sort of uplifted. Everybody is like talking just a little bit faster. They're a little bit more excited, smiling. Like, because, and this is what we should want, right? We should want to create experiences and learning, learning experiences and otherwise that give you this feeling all the time. Like it, it helps you sort of, it moves you towards that feeling of mastery. It moves you towards that feeling of engagement to use a word that's been around since the middle nineties. We're just keep talking about that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all about employee workplace passion. Like all, we can use all of the buzzwords we want, but it, you all became happier when we talked about that. And, and if that doesn't move us as an industry to do this, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what we need. It's going to take a really big swift kick in the pants uh, if, if we can't just decide to do it because it makes people happier. Right. Um, anyways. I'm gonna, the, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm just going to butt in and pause because yeah. Meryl asked in the chat the oh. name of the an author. It's How to Keep House While Drowning by Casey Davis. And she is Domestic Blisters on TikTok domestic blisters. That's, that's fantastic. So, okay. I know, I know we have been going on. I know that you guys are sticking with me a little bit longer than we planned. And I appreciate that. I want to, I want to wrap it up really quick. I'm going to ask you to give me two, like one or two sentences as to what do you want L and D peeps to know about accessibility from the standpoint of someone who could truly benefit. So I'm going to just really kind of boil it down to what's the, what's the short answer to what do you really want them to know? And Meryl, what do you think? What do you really want L&D peeps to know? All students benefit from accessibility. We all get it all day long. Yeah. We need to get it out of our head that accessibility is just for people with disability. That's right. Everybody benefit. Accessibility that students learn access information in their preferred way mm -hmm. and remember information better when it's accessible. And this is not about learning styles, definitely not. Yeah. Um, the right thing is UDL, universal design for learning. That's the better route, but that's a whole- That's another other podcast. Conversation and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Diane. I would say it's know your audience, but don't pretend to know your audience. Mm. So we need to know who might be in our audience and what they might, what barriers we might be throwing up if we're not um, empathetic. We've used that word a lot today, mm -hmm. empathetic about their situation. But we also shouldn't make decisions for people about what they can and can't accomplish in their life. Somebody can't do this if, well, that's not my job to that's say. Not your job, yeah. So know your audience. Get to know people who have um, conditions that could that your design choices could cause a barrier for. Mm. Get to know some people. And that's going to give you a lot of fuel to be motivated to make some decisions. Jessica, what do you want people to know? 
Um, I, I think a, a couple of things. So one, if, if people can't access the information um, or intake the information for whatever reason or participate and interact with their fellow learners and uh, the, you know, whoever's delivering the training or the, um, the web-based version, uh, they just aren't learning. You know, we spend so much time purposely designing our mm-hmm. product so that people will learn. And so we just aren't achieving our goal if we don't make it so that everybody has access to the information and gets to um, engage in those activities that helps them encode the information. It's really that simple. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was we all, you all already have the skills needed to do this. Um, as as Diane uh, sort of alluded to, like it, you, you just have to know your audience. So it's we just need to include this in our audience analysis and the design mm-hmm. and the development of our delivery phases. That's all. You just include it as part of the process you're already doing. We all use Google to research information we want to include in our courses or when we're using a product to develop the content and we're like, oh, I want to learn how to use that functionality so I can do this neat little thing. I go Google that procedure procedure and then I can do it in the application. Same thing here. All you have to do is use Google, um, Word, Adobe, all those other products already include the functionality to make things accessible. And so you can very easily just Google the process for using those things and and learn how to do that. Um, And lastly, it really is pretty easy. It's just a few more clicks and you're writing a few more sentences to describe Mm -hmm. the um, graphics, to send the message and that kind of thing. So um, we, we already are using those skills every time we design and develop it's it's just not that much more to add very good Susie yeah so I think uh, mine probably comes from a Merrill's t-shirt actually Mm -hmm. progress over perfection so I think um, I think accessibility can I, I, I do agree with you Jessica but I think sometimes accessibility has it has this kind of a label and assumption that it is very very complicated and I think it can be quite a scary thing to get started with so I think that the idea of progress over perfection is is you know a a really important mantra it's almost like uh, yes just you know just make a start with it just start somewhere I I sometimes call making a micro commitment so even if it's something like putting alternative text on your social media posts finding out making sure that you're always putting captions on you know if you just do one thing doing one thing will automatically lead to the next thing but it is starting off with that one thing that is that don't be overwhelmed with it don't don't worry about making mistakes with it just try and and improve you know and 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 make your all of your digital content um, accessible and judy wrap us up i'm really honored that you keep giving me the last word especially (laughs) Um, this is honestly, this has been such an amazing experience. Everybody here has such a personal stake and such deep knowledge and expertise. I'm honored to be here. I truly am. Um, but I'm going to say something that I hope goes hand in hand with Susie's because I love the idea of just do one thing and just get started. And I hope that this doesn't scare people away from that. Um, it's more keep it going upstream because considerations of accessibility start at a much more fundamental level than most of us really think about them. It's not just adding the alt text at the end, it's hiring the people who know how to, you know, to to do the the things that need to be done, um, making the the policies and procedures that you will follow, um, choosing your uh, learning methodology, whether it's going to be an in-person event versus e-learning versus virtual instructor-led, et cetera, and how that affects all of your your learners. Um, yes, just get started and, and do one thing and keep it moving to the strategic level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm, go- I'm actually going to get the last word on this one because I have something that I want to say because I've, I've so enjoyed these conversations. We made this three episodes. I think it could have been 13 and we would mm-hmm. still be talking because there's so much great stuff. Um, but what I want to say is we did say the word empathy a lot. And here's what I would tell you. If you're not in a place where you know someone or or are, you know, ha- have a, a space where you can be empathetic for those who might be truly in need of these things, not just not just those that will use the ramp that actually needed the ramp to be built to begin and to begin with. 
if you don't have that, please get that, just like Diane said. But here's the thing. A lot of times we get stuck in empathy, right? Because empathy, we're so busy mirroring the emotions that we – uh, that that we we forget to be objective and actually do something about how we feel. So yeah, we f- we can feel how you feel and understand it, but we're not doing anything. And that's where compassion comes in, because compassion is empathy with action. And if you don't put those two together, you'll listen to this, you'll come away, you'll know more about accessibility, and you will do nothing. And that is not that's empathy. It's just not very compassionate. It's not. You need to take that action. So that's what I want people to know is that just like Susie said, it's that one thing that you can do, but keep doing more things like do that one thing today. And then next week, let's do one more thing and keep taking those actions that you need. Um, So thank you guys so much. I am so grateful for this time that we've spent. I do want one more question. Where can people find you if they want to after the show? Um, And we'll go in same order because why not? Meryl, you're up first. Meryl.net, M-E-R-Y-L.net, just like Meryl Streep, just look for Meryl Evans, not Streep. Meryl Evans, yeah. I, and I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me easily. There was Wonderful. One. Perfect. Diane. Diane Elkins, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn is my social media of choice. You can also check out my occasional blogging at elearninguncovered.com. And shameless plug, my one-day pre-conference workshop at Training 2023, One Day on Accessibility. Very excited about that. That's an an investment you should make in yourself. That's fantastic. Jessica. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. And then my email address is just my first and last name. So Jessica Kiriazis at AOL.com. Wonderful. Susie. So, yes, I'm also on LinkedIn and um, I have uh, my company website is um, ellahub.net and my email address is suzymiller at ellahub.net. All right. And oh, you can also find Susie Miller in designing accessible learning content. <laughs> okay. Which I actually... I the flags. I, I'm surprised. When you first mentioned the, the book early on, I looked around because I rarely have rarely is it not within arm's reach but i cleaned up my office and so i actually I had to walk around my desk to get it so i'm not going to make <laughs> and so mistake. so tell us again diane what's the name of the book that Susie it wrote it's called uh, designing accessible learning content by Susie miller excellent and Susie, is that available electronically yes it is yes oh, through, through the um yes through the it's publisher perfect. kogan page oh thank you perfect. yeah J- judy uh Definitely on LinkedIn. I'm super easy to find Judy Katz and um, I hang out there every day. So I love yeah. to connect with people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, Diane, Judy, Merrill, and Susie for sharing your thoughts today. And thanks to the listeners for hanging out with us. Don't forget to tell your friends and watch for another episode of the If You Ask Betty podcast soon. Peace out. I just want to thank you all so much. I feel like I learned so much today, things that, you know, I, I, hope I'm always conscious of, but realized by hearing so much of this that I wasn't necessarily, but it was more inspirational than scolding. Um, It was just such a neat learning opportunity. And I'm I'm truly grateful for the experience. Thank you so much. Oh, you said everything that's in my heart. Absolutely. Jessica, I learned a lot from you and always do. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. I'm I cannot 